Now, if you were from the North comparing social safety nets, part two, and part two, as we indicated in our last show, Ken Rogers and me, uh, is about the homeless situation in Canada. To compare it with the homeless situation in, in Seattle and points east and west in continental United States, for that matter, in Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hi, Jay. So, you know, the thing is that a few years ago, I mean, in, well, well, within our lifetimes, uh, there was no homeless problem. Really, you didn't see it, you didn't hear about it, you didn't read about it. Then all of a sudden, well, maybe, maybe, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, there was homeless everywhere. And I, for the life of me, can understand, cannot understand uh, the, you know, the vectors that have created this problem all within the last few years. Suffice to say, it exists in the U.S., uh, everywhere, every, every major city, and it exists in Canada, too. I was surprised to find that out. Because I always think that Canada is actually in its own way better at handling the social safety net. Um, but tell us how it exists in Canada and Western Canada uh, and what it looks like, for example, when you go to Vancouver and you look at Hastings Street, which I saw a few years ago when I visited you. There's Hastings Street. What does that tell us, Ken? Well, the uh, Canadians have not done a better job of handling homelessness as you see it on the streets of. Uh, let's say Seattle and Vancouver are the two that I know best in terms of the large Canadian city and large U.S. city, where the mess is about the same, or the disgrace is about the same, or the horrific uh, situation is about the same. Now, if you were to list all the people that are on, um, let's say, why do you have a so social safety net? And who are the people that you're trying to cover that with? Well, you'd say old age. Well, you don't find any old age people. All the people that were under the social safety net 20 years ago, they're still under there. This is, this is kind of like a new group that, that doesn't list the deserve to be there in some people's mind. Now, uh, you know, one of the keys is um, is drugs uh, and alcohol. Um, so you end up with a bunch of people that are really deserve to be in a hospital under a alcohol or drug treatment center. There is no such adequate treatment in Canada or the U.S. Uh, similarly. Um, with the um, <clears throat> uh, the drugs, uh, they're really, um, it's sort of an illegal activity so that it's sort of shoved to the side and it is not treated as a health problem. Uh, you've got the um, people who are living in those homeless tents and so on committing a variety of crimes they're picked up by the police, they're taken to court, and a couple hours later, they're back on the street, or a couple of days sometimes. So they're just an endless number of repeat offenders. So you need um, a total change in, in the laws um, in order to deal with, you know, how do you deal with a person that's addicted to drugs, that's an, an, a repeat offender, and living on the street? Um, you know, you, you really have difficulty doing that. Uh, and I don't think uh, the United States has done any better at it than Canada has. You know what's done better? And it's a kind of, uh, you know, Commonwealth place, and that's uh, Singapore. In fact, uh, in a week's time, we're going to have a show with a Singaporean woman who is going to explain to us why there is no homelessness at all in Singapore. I don't know the answer to the question. I just know there is an answer, and I know that uh, Singapore has examined and succeeded in some sort of plan um, to minimize or, or, or completely um, you know, avoid homelessness. Uh, it's, not, it's not like there's no solution here. Well, well let, let me show you, you know, if, if we have a, um, a shot available of uh, Hastings Street in Vancouver, uh, the way the uh, homeless uh, scenario uh, exists there right now. 
Um, I don't know if um, if the viewers can see that, but um, it, it's about three blocks long, totally blocks uh, the sidewalk from one edge to to the of the road to the buildings, and that um, it's it's really one where the city of Vancouver has had an order that the police are supposed to move the encampment, you know, and they really are unable to. Well, you're sitting with a with a a large group of the residents are ones that are on drugs or um, alcohol, or they have a mental illness. And then you've got a, a bunch of others that are generally uh, males between, you know, 25 and 40 that are in pretty good physical condition that kind of play warlords or, you know, they're, um, they live off the rest of the homeless. And that uh, whenever there's a police effort to show up, you know, they are always in the background making or even in the front making an awful lot of noise about, well, we have nowhere else to live and and an end and end and they get enough sympathy that, the, you know, the authorities back off. And in Vancouver, when they move them from off of a particular place, example, they were before they moved to Hastings Street, they were in a large park. Well, they moved them out of the park and had, you know, was like a garbage dump when they finally got them out of there. You know, well, then they just moved to another place. So you, you know, you, I would guess that Singapore probably had a, uh, a fairly adept uh, police force that, that jumped on it early and that, uh, you know, they um, have some way that they're dealing with their, uh, the, what I call the mental problems or the health problems. I think of, of drugs, alcohol, and mental illness all as mental problems problems where many years ago, Canada and the United States used to have, you know, mental asylums, uh, you know, and, and you tended to have people in an institution that had a mental, uh, mental thing. Uh, now they can't go to a hospital. They're on the street. Yeah. Let me, let me add a, a factor that comes to mind. Uh, I'll call it the Lord of the Flies factor, the phenomenon. <laughs> You know, in 1969, uh, you and I already knew each other for several years in 1969. Um, my wife and I found ourselves stuck on the New England Turnpike because it was Woodstock. And at Woodstock, hundreds of thousands of young people were at Woodstock uh, having a music festival. And it was um, a phenomenon. It was, uh, relatively speaking, it was well-behaved. Um, it was fun. It was music. Um, and the poor farm, the farmer who owned that land, you know, he suffered. But essentially, you know, I don't think anybody was killed. I don't think anybody was badly hurt. And uh, yeah, there was drugs and, you know, there was alcohol, but uh, they, they managed to keep it civilized. There was no Lord of the Flies phenomenon working. Okay, The same promoters who did 19, in 1969 did another one in 19... 90, 96, I think it was, several years later, I mean, like 30 years later. Um, and um, it was also likewise in upstate New York. It was on a, um, a, um, a, 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 uh, a, a decommissioned Air Force base there, I forget the name of the base. And um, they had um, the same number of people, hundreds of thousands of people. And it was a different generation, Ken. Uh, it was a different structure. And the Lord of the Flies phenomenon presented itself. And these kids went wild. They literally burned the place down. There was violence. There was wholesale rape. Uh, there were all kinds of injuries. Um, the musicians, you know, left. They couldn't tolerate, you know, the disorder. And I'm saying to myself, you always have that risk. And maybe we have that risk more now. Maybe that's a factor somehow that plays into uh, the young people on Hastings Street. 
um, this Lord of the Flies. There's no control. There's no structure. Uh, and they, you know, they're out there, you know, doing what comes naturally. Um, whether there is alcohol or drugs or not, they're doing what comes naturally. Um, it, maybe it's a different generation we're speaking about. Maybe it, it's a different, mm, a different way of looking at things. But the second uh, Woodstock was way different than the first. Well, a lot of times you get um, the underlying economic situation affects a whole generation. You know, for example, the baby boom reached its peak in approximately 1960. So kids that were born uh, in the early 60s to the mid 70s, which would be the same generation that shows up at Woodstock in the late 90s, um, you know, they're, they, uh, when they hit the job market, all jobs were full and they were all full of baby boomers that were not a heck of a lot older than them and that weren't going to go anywhere for years and years and years and years. And all of those baby boomers had wonderful education, you know, compared to their parents and that, uh, and so that their economic opportunity, their upside was not the same as you know, the kids 10 and 15 years older than them, uh, where you and I born and, you know, during the war, um, you know, we had like a golden spoon compared to the kids that were born, you know, in the mid 60s um, or the early 60s, um, <clears throat> because any time if, if you were out of a job, uh, you could get one in a few minutes. I can remember when I was in high school. A friend of mine and I were were on a, you know, a, a concrete crew. You know, we were scrawny kids, age sixteen sort of thing or fifteen, and uh, they're pushing one of those big concrete buckets. And we were on a crew with a bunch of uh, really husky Italians, and they thought it'd be really cute if uh, if we, um, uh, you know, had more concrete in our bucket. You know, so when the lift comes up the up the side of this building and, and they fill this concrete bucket, well, every so often they had to move the planks where you'd roll these concrete buckets too. You'd like the there was a concrete truck at the bottom and they'd pump it up to the top and in these buckets and then you'd roll a bucket over to somewhere in the top of this building. Well, we were on the ten story building and and uh, this bucket was so full, my friend and I let, let the bucket off the building. Like it, <laughs> we couldn't make the corner when the, this bucket was supposed to turn. And uh, so, you know, we were instantly fired. Well, about, about four hours later, we had another job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, uh, where, where, you know, that, uh, you know, that, um, uh, Difficulty for that generation of kids is is that way, and 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 a lot of it affected their attitude towards uh, drugs and and alcohol and and other people. Um, and I don't know whether you know the generations after them have have improved a lot um, because I haven't been uh, you know hiring a whole bunch of young people to get a a feeling. So would you say that the um, the homelessness problem? in Canada is more likely to affect young people? Because, you know, I know in Hawaii, a lot of the people who are homeless are, you know, elderly. They don't have another option and they, you know, wheel around a shopping cart and that's their life. And it's really, it's really tragic to see them operate. Are you saying in Canada, there are more, maybe it's so everywhere, I don't know, um, that the homeless people are, are, are younger and um, do, you know, uh, not in the same spectrum of age? Well, I, I don't think we've got very many quite old people in Canada. Uh, homeless people here don't include a large number of, of what I would call seniors. You may have a slug between, you know, 45 and 60, um, especially men that are on drugs or have some mental problem. But... Um, uh, you know, we have a, an unusual high proportion of our homeless are natives. Like, 
you know, because Canada has way more natives than the U.S. because you killed all yours off, or you killed <laughs> off most of them. You mean you mean Native Indians? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like in Canada, in a couple of provinces, Newfoundland in particular, they did the American method of solving their what they considered their Indian problem, and that was just wipe them out. You know, where especially the further you get west in Canada, the you know almost like the higher percentage of the population is still native. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you saying a good part of the, the population of homeless is native? In yes. Western Canada? Yeah. Yes. And a lot of it comes to legal problems, not unlike um, my earlier legal suggestion on, on mental illness and drugs being a mm -hmm. health problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> you also have you know that kind of problem with the discrimination in Canada is there and it has some uh, you know overtones that are similar to the US if you get a small portion of the population that's running around doing something that the public doesn't like it's kind of treated as if well all of those people are the same you know, we're in Canada, they're definitely not, you know, we've got some uh, of our natives are, are wonderful, high performing citizens, but we sure have a slug of them in the homeless community. Well, you know, that's uh, some, something to, for us, for you and me to discuss in a later show, that is the diversity in Canada. It differs from the diversity in the U.S. in, in I think, many ways, and we should make the, that distinction. But let me let me pose something to you, Ken, which I think is is really critical in both places. And uh, I mean, I know I know that it's critical in the U.S. I don't know that it's critical in Canada. You'll have to confirm that to me. There was an article in the Times today about um, some fellow who was running for Congress, and he was like twenty five years old. And and the notion of the article was, hey, this is a whole new source. Of um, of Congress people, of candidates, of uh, politically activated people, um, who could change a broken democracy, who could step up and uh, you know have the benefit of their education and be uh, fair minded and um, you know not not uh, QAnon or anything, and run for office and win for office on the basis of their youth, their vitality and their clarity, and it's coming. I don't know if it's going to come soon enough, but it's coming. On the other hand, on the other hand, and this is the point, all those people uh, in Seattle, San Francisco, L.A., New York, um, you know, you name Boston, you name it, who are on the streets, young people, okay, um, they're not productive in terms of the political profile of the country. Uh, they're not following the news. I doubt that they are. Um, they're not, uh, whether they're educated or not, they're not following it, they're not participating in the political process, or for that matter, in the public conversation. They have withdrawn, okay, from society. That's part of being in a homeless community, such as the picture on Hastings Street. And we lose them. They're not going to be around to participate in the next generation of, of political officials and candidates. Uh, is, now, you think that's happening in Canada, too? Well, most of the Canadian youth have also been sucked into their iPhone. You know, I don't know what you'd call it, but uh, but certainly everybody's walking around with their hand in front of them, including the, all the middle-aged women, um, and, but especially the young people. I mean, they you go to a restaurant and... and uh, you know, there may be four people at a table and all four of them are looking down at their device rather than talking to each other. Uh, so I certainly agree with you that uh, they don't seem to be engaged. Uh, certainly from a Canadian point of view, when you look at the U.S. and you see the scenario that people, uh, you know, treat uh, Trump uh, the way they have uh, in the sense of uh, as if he was... Uh, innocent of all things and you know being you know wrongly accused of things instead of being the the rogue and damage to the u.s democracy that he is or at least 
from Canada, it looks that way for sure. Uh, now, perhaps that's because I watch the news and I watch a variety of news. Uh, well, okay. I mean, I, you know, do you have this, when I say you, I mean, people in Canada have the same concern that the, mm, the body of citizens that shape the elected, you know, the body of elected officials um, has gone south. In the U.S., it certainly has. You know, half of the electorate, or roughly half, uh, you know, support a guy who is destroying democracy. Um, is that phenomenon? Is that perception? Is that, you know, set of circumstances uh, the same in Canada? Do you have that concern in Canada? And uh, I guess my question is, what about the youth? Are, are the youth part of that? Uh, are they helping, hindering, not involved? What are they? Um, the participation in our voting is still heavily towards the seniors and not as many young people voting, but we don't have the same radicalization as the Republican Party in the United States. I mean, both our key parties, we actually have three parties, uh, and the two of them make a coalition government at this time. Both of them, uh, you know, the main party is is sort of what I call center left, and the party that they're coalescing with is extreme left. They're like Barney, Bernie Sanders level. Um, and uh, <clears throat> but we don't have uh, you know people that are you know going to storm the the parliament. We have um, mild versions of some of those extreme people. You know, we had a trucker dispute in where they showed up at the border crossings with 18 wheelers to, you know, blockade uh, some trade. Uh, and they also had it in the nation's capital. They brought a bunch of blo uh, 18 wheelers and beeped their horns, but that was it. You mm -hmm. know, there was no storming of parliament. There was no, you know, thumping the police or, you know, carrying a bunch of guns, et cetera. Uh, no, you know, your um, your comments about uh, Hastings Street and about homeless youth um, on Hastings Street and elsewhere in Canada uh, suggest to me that people really don't like to have, um, you know, the homeless around them, particularly if they're disorderly. And I suppose a lot of people in the U.S. feel that way. I do. Um, but the question is, um, you know, isn't this a social phenomenon? Um, can you blame them? Do you blame them? Um, and do you blame the police for not uh, removing them uh, and not stopping their, you know, criminal activities such as, you know, they engage in? Um, and what, you know, what do people want the government to do? Uh, and does the government have any intention, do public officials have any intention of doing anything about this? Or is it just going to get worse on Hastings Street, you know, Toronto, Montreal, you name it. Well, I suppose you need to come back to a, a premise in the social security net. You know, it was really that you um, help somebody who was temporarily unemployed get back on their feet and back into the workforce. You know, there's not a thought of that person being on the street. You help the you know, the single mother where the courts have been unwilling to, uh, you know, push the uh, the husband to pay any support or he's totally disappeared. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but the lack of good support legal side, you know, for that uh, causes a, a huge um, scale of, of single mothers, pregnant mothers that society looks after you don't see them on the, on Hastings street or any of these streets you know so who were you supposed to be helping you know you have handicapped people now you do see some handicapped people but they usually are also um addicted to alcohol or drugs um so you're you're really dealing you know with um who is it that is there? The you, your young people. I don't see what I would call 
in their 20s. There's very, very few late teens and 20 year olds on the streets in, in Canada in a homeless sense. You know, uh, the ones that are, uh, you know, you've got some that uh, are on drugs and alcohol that are a little older, but, um, you know, the, the only young people you see are the ones that are taking advantage of the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it going to get worse? Uh, um, I would think it'll get worse before there's corrective measures taken to to um, uh, deal with uh, the mental illness. You know, the, what we can't have people with mental problems in the hospitals. There's not enough room. They've eliminated the specialty facilities for the mentally ill with uh, all of the drug and alcohol problems you know both of which i call you know once somebody's hooked is a, it's a mental or it's a uh, a medical problem but it's also a mental problem or it's a separate one you you just got to have those types of facilities i mean vancouver city has even gone to the extreme of recommending to the province who again recommended it to our federal government that they make special legislation making possession of a small amount of any kind of drug is not a crime. You know, so that and the basic idea was if uh, if a person who is dead can't be <laughs> redeemed, you know, they can't they can't recover. You know, and, and the idea is a lot of these people are recoverable for the good of society and for their family and themselves. And human nature would say we should try to assist them to recover if they don't have enough incentive themselves. Well, that's a lot of the problem with the homeless is this lack of incentive to do anything different. What can the government do? I mean, if you... If you were, um, you know, the prime minister and uh, <laughs> and, I, and it gave you all the authority in the world, what would you do to improve this problem? Because this is the this is the blight on every city. It's the blight on on the society in Canada and certainly in the U.S. Well, I would certainly be more heavy-handed than Vancouver City has been recently, um, and and they've let this thing get to a point where it's really, really difficult. Now, other cities, uh, you know, like Kelowna, uh, ha in the center of British Columbia is a city about 250,000 people. So it's pretty tiny compared to Vancouver. But uh, we still have a fair homeless problem, but our, our police, uh, you know, clean the people off of any street that uh, you know they ought not to be on and you know they um uh you know they seem to be not as big a nuisance but there's still way too much of it for the public mm -hmm. you know but those ones um you know you you take who is a, le a repeat offender of any offense and you've got to forcibly put them somewhere now jails are expensive you know you've got to run them through some kind of testing to see whether they really really wish to be a productive member of society they wish to get off the the drugs and and booze and and in particular off the street um but you've got such a huge percentage of them they just don't want to get off the street no, I think there's a community factor. You know, uh, they they're, they're they they find friends there, they they're find uh, consolation there, and and uh, and they and they uh, I don't want to say enjoy, but maybe that's appropriate. Uh, they want to be with that crowd, and the crowd wants to be with them, and and so they're gonna you know they're gonna migrate together. Isn't that part of it? That is definitely part of it. They certainly you know uh, object to the authority, and you know as a group. Um, and, you know, Canada doesn't, uh, have a history of, of, you know, cleaning up crowds in the same aggressive way that, uh, 
countries around the world do and you know some of the times uh, the u.s does a bit uh, heavy-handed but uh you know that we don't bring big fire hoses out and just blast them off the street um but uh <clears throat> we need to do more than we're doing for sure okay well maybe you should run uh, for a prime minister and and get get this done ken you know i'm reminded of uh of Market Street in San Francisco. Market Street, very wide sidewalks, you know, like mm, at least yeah. 20, 20 feet along Market Street. And the uh, last time I was there, it was covered, you know, one side to the other with homeless kids, mostly young. Well, that's um, about the width of Hastings. Yeah, Hastings, yeah I mean, Hastings. very luxurious sidewalks and, and covered with people. And you could hardly step through the people. There was an eyesore and it was a deprivation of my rights or anybody's rights as a citizen to walk down the bloody sidewalk. And so, I mean, we never forget that when they take over a park or a sidewalk, uh, they're making it hard for everyone else. Can and you imagine the business that is on the between, you know, next to that sidewalk? You know, yes. Hastings Street in Vancouver was a a prosperous business street you know before the uh pandemic you know now you had the covid in the middle and you know and then the, all of these uh homeless end up there in the meantime yeah well when you said that i thought for a moment you're talking about another kind of business and and where does that go in in the street itself on the sidewalk uh, there are no bathrooms around uh, for people who want to spend all day on the sidewalk that way. So, I mean, it really is a deterioration of our cityscape. It's a deterioration of, you know, the, the social organization of the city. And it becomes more and more a, a problem and more and more um, a requirement that something is done. And I, I'm, I'm not happy that Canada has the same issues as so many American cities. In fact, it's um, it's kind of it's consoling uh, that you do. On the other hand, um, there must be solutions like in Singapore, where we can ameliorate this. The point is, it didn't happen 20 years ago. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. Now, all of a sudden, maybe it's rays from space, you know, that have changed our world, and it is happening, and it has every indication of continuing. Yeah, well, I don't know how the homeless connects to, you know, the prevalence of um, of soup kitchens or or food banks. You know, in the U.S., you got your your food stamps. You know, but those programs have all expanded dramatically in scale, and I don't know, you know, specifically, you know what portion of homeless people use a food bank but it's almost like a totally different group you know food banks people drive to in a vehicle and pick up food you know they at least have enough for, for a vehicle of the ones in canada you know they you know downtown or soup kitchens there's a lot of those near the uh the homeless people uh you know and i don't know what portion of meals they get out of the people like the Salvation Army and equivalent charities. You and know, we, haven't, we haven't even touched on COVID, how COVID may, may have exacerbated, accelerated this whole process. Um, you know, uh, talk about mental illness. I mean, I, I don't know if it's a, a statistical thing, but it seems to me that the amount of mental illness you could find if you look in this country and in Canada has uh, dramatically increased over the past. Um, a few years. Part of it is COVID. Um, part of it is being on the street. You know, if you if you don't have a an ordinary social experience, um, that's going to affect your mental abilities and stability. So we haven't really we haven't solved the problem here, Ken. Perhaps <laughs> COVID. You know, perhaps I was at a side thought was COVID in a lot of ways simply had everybody else's guard down. You know, the lots of the businesses, you know, they were temporarily closed. Well, that's a good time to set up your tent. You Absolutely. Know, or, yeah. you know, the, the 
police is not are not as busy because you know COVID is on there. You know the cities are pretty quiet. You know the great time to create your little community of tents. Well, the only thing that comes to mind, and we're out of time here, is that if you want to you know solve this problem, you have to look deeply into it. You have to find out the fundamental flaws in the society that allow this to happen and uh, exacerbate, and then you have to address them. And um, I can only say that if we don't do that, and we haven't, um, then we really haven't looked for those fundamental flaws, and we haven't addressed them. And, and we're only going to solve this when we do that. So, And I would say it's probably both the same in Canada and the U.S. Yeah, it really is. You've got to meet the the mega health problems with a bunch of you know, financial money from governments of, on high, and you've got to tie in your your legal and policing to to match it. Yeah, and make housing. Um, that's that is oh, housing is a big problem unto itself. I, I mean, <laughs> it's almost an endless bucket. Uh, yeah. But uh, but there's a difference between what what standard of housing people want. I mean, you, you watch in Japan, somebody's going to stay, uh, you know, downtown for the evening and they, and they rent a, a cubicle, you know, like a six by three by three cubicle in a wall, <laughs> um, you know, where, where, you know, in, in Kelowna, I was looking at a project the other day that was a subsidized housing project you know, where, you know, this is people that are supposedly totally distraught and unable and they're providing them, you know, a, a 1,400 square foot, three bedroom townhouse. I mean, I mean that's nuts. <laughs> it's yeah. <no> wonder. <laughs> well, it's not going to not going to work. That's a very interesting question about Japan. And I think um, we should we should address that on one of our shows to see what the homeless situation is in Japan, what the housing situation is. Ken, it's been a great discussion with you. Um, we'll come back for more in a couple of weeks. It's great to make these comparisons and see how, how things are north of the border. Thank you so much. All right. Bye for now. Ken Rogers, a retired businessman uh, in Kelowna, British Columbia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.